morning. Um, today, we'd like to welcome Dr. Kyle Orwig and Dr. Serena Chan for their Grand Rounds presentation. Dr. Kyle Orwig is a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He is also the director of the Fertility Preservation Program and the Center for Reproduction and Transplantation at McGee Women's Hospital of UPMC. Dr. Orwig received his Bachelor of Science from Whitworth College and received his PhD from Oregon State University with postdoctorate training at both the University of Kansas Medical Center and University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. He heads a laboratory located within McGee Women's Research Institute and McGee Women's Hospital, which is committed to translating lab bench discoveries to the clinic for diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of infertility by focusing on stem cells, germline, or germ lineage development, fertility, and infertility. Their progress in investigating reproductive function in fertile individuals provides a basis for understanding the mechanisms of infertility caused by disease, medical treatments, genetic defects, and aging. Dr. Serena Chan is an assistant professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. She heads the Division of Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Dr. Chan received her Bachelor of Science from Yale University and received her medical degree from Oregon Health and Science University School of Medicine. Dr. Chan completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at UPMC McGee Women's Hospital and then a clinical fellowship in pediatric and adolescent gynecology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Dr. Chan specializes in pediatric and adolescent gynecology and provides general and specialized gynecologic care to children and adolescents. Her areas of interest include the management of congenital reproductive tract anomalies, minimally invasive gynecologic surgery in adolescents, fertility preservation in patients receiving gonadotoxic therapy, and reproductive endocrine issues in children, adolescents, and young adults. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Orwig and Dr. Chan today for their Grand Rounds presentation on fertility preservation. Thank you. Dr. Chan, please feel free to share your slides and un, um, unmute and start the presentation. All right, can you guys now see my slides? Can we move down this yes. yes. Okay, and it's in presentation mode. All right, perfect. Well, thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, the objectives of the talk today, at the conclusion of this presentation, participants should be able to explain indications for fertility preservation, summarize standard of care and experimental fertility preservation options for children and young adults, um, understand fertility preservation options available through the UPMC Fertility Preservation Program, and also discuss barriers to fertility preservation. In 2018, there were an estimated 18 million new cancer cases diagnosed worldwide. Um, close to 200,000 of these patients were pediatric patients between the ages of zero to 14 years old, and close to a million of these patients were um, in the adolescent and young adult um, age group. Due to early de uh, detection as well as newer targeted therapies, Survival at this time is at a historical high with an estimated 28 million survivors of reproductive age worldwide. So this is um, certainly a large population. And what do we know about the survivors of childhood cancer? Um, this data here depicted um, on this slide is from the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort Study. Um, this data was published in 2013 and this table here depicts um, patients who are in at-risk groups um, who underwent exposure-based screening. 
So for reproductive late effects, at-risk uh, patients are classified as those who received alkylating chemotherapy agents or radiation to the reproductive system. Um, so interestingly, um, the prevalence of primary ovarian insufficiency in this group was 11.8% in the at-risk females. And the prevalence of male germ cell dysfunction was approximately 66%. And the prevalence of lytic cell insufficiency was 11.5%. So this is not an insignificant number. This table here, um, this graph shows the impact of um, cancer on subsequent chance of pregnancy. This was a retrospective cohort study out of Scotland that was published in 2018. Um, and they looked at the pregnancy rate of um, cancer survivors versus controls. And they found that across all diagnoses, um, young adult survivors between the ages of 18 to 39 years old, they were 38% less likely to conceive compared to controls. And you can see there, we, we have um, some diagnoses commonly seen in the adolescent young adults um, population or childhood population, including leukemia and Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, and the chance of achieving a first pregnancy greater than five years after diagnosis was also decreased compared to the control population. Um, certainly the decrease in pregnancy rate could be due to various factors, certainly um, gonadal insufficiency, but other uh, medical late effects potentially, as well as some of the social and sexual impacts of um, their treatment and diagnoses. And it's been well established that certain chemotherapy agents um, can have a, a gonadotoxic impact. Um, specifically, we most commonly think of the alkylating agents such as cyclophosphamide. And it's been well established that this has, um, incurs a high risk of gonadotoxicity for both ovaries as well as testes. Um, we also know that ionizing radiation can also cause gonadal injury. Um, as little as two grays of radiation to um, the ovaries can actually cause depletion of up to 50% of primordial follicles um, in the ovary. So I'll talk a little bit more about risk stratification. So um, this table here is um, derived from work of the Pediatric Initiative ne Network of the Oncofertility Consortium. Um, so the PIN, as it's known, formed a multidisciplinary group to um, try to standardize risk assessment for um, treatment-related gonadal insufficiency and infertility in childhood and young adult cancer patients. Traditionally, um, the risk categories have traditionally been um, split into low, intermediate, and high risk. Um, in this system, the risk categories were classified as minimally increased risk, significantly increased risk, and high level of increased risk. And there was a deliberate um, change in wording to try and help stress that low risk does not equal no risk. Um, and here, as you can see, um, as is pretty standard, um, alkylators, um, the dose of alkylators are, are represented as cyclophosphamide equivalent doses or CEDs. Um, and it also includes uh, other chemotherapy agents such as heavy metals, and then also um, radiation exposure and surgery as well. So for female risk stratification, they further um, broke down the categories into prepubertal and pubertal status. And you can see there um, the, the higher doses of um, both chemotherapy as well as um, radiation um, for, for prepubertal patients. And so what about the newer agents that are being used now? Um, we don't have currently have enough data to really give a great sense of the gonadotoxicity of a lot of the newer agents. However, um, an exception would be bevacizumab. Um, for bevacizumab, um, primary ovarian insufficiency was noted in 34% um, of um, patients um, undergoing um, treatment for colorectal cancer with 
bevacizumab containing regimens compared to only 2% in patients who are receiving the same regimen without bevacizumab. Um, the FDA in 2015 changed their labeling um, for pregnancy and lactation to include fertility risks. And um, they're slowly phasing in uh, drugs that were approved between 2001 and 2015. So hopefully we'll have more data soon regarding the gonadotoxicity, gonadotoxicity and impact of fertility of some of the newer agents. It has been well established at this point that the offspring of patients who receive chemotherapy for cancer in childhood and adolescence don't have a higher rate of congenital anomalies compared to baseline. And this is an important point um, to note. And so at this point, um, we now have expert consensus position statements from position, uh, professional societies across different disciplines underlining the importance of fertility preservation counseling. Um, and some of the key points that I've included here, um, physicians should perform uh, should inform cancer patients about options for fertility preservation and future reproduction prior to treatment. Um, and also this counseling should be provided regardless of the patient's age, gender, culture, socioeconomic status, or healthcare team bias. And another important point is that um, this counseling should continue throughout treatment and survivorship in a manner appropriate to the patient's developmental stage at that time. So um, when it comes to fertility preservation counseling or fertility um, risk counseling, it shouldn't be a one-time deal. Um, it should be an ongoing conversation. And these position statements have been supported by both ACOG as well as the AAP. However, despite this um, consensus um, across various specialties, um, there's still a gap in practice. Um, in a 2016 study depicted in the graphic here on the slide, less than 50% of cancer patients actually recalled discussing fertility risks with their healthcare provider. And only 30% of patients actually went on to receive fertility preservation therapies. You know, certainly there could be some recall bias here, um, but this really shows that um, we could all be doing better as healthcare providers. And so with all that background information established, um, what are the available fertility preservation methods? So I'll first review the standard methods. Um, mature oocyte crowd preservation is a standard of care option that's available to pubertal females um, a stimulation cycle can take as little as 10 to 14 days. Um, the oocyte retrieval is typically done under sedation, occasionally under general anesthesia. Um, and important to note, stimulation can occur at any phase of the cycle. So um, random start is possible. Um, but it's also important to note that while um, this may preserve fertility, it doesn't pre pre um, preserve ovarian hormonal function. Um, sperm cryo preservation is available for pubertal males. And it's relatively non-invasive and straightforward. Typically, we recommend at least collection of two samples um, prior to uh, treatment exposure. Um, embryo cryopreservation is another well-established fertility preservation method. However, in, the, um, in children and the adolescent young adult population, this is done less frequently, um, mainly because um, many patients in this population don't have a stable partner. Um, ovarian transposition is a surgical procedure that can be performed for patients receiving pelvic radiation. And in this case, the ovaries are transposed out of the field of um, radiation and, and transfixed and then later um, returned to their anatomic location. Um, ovarian and testicular shielding is also another standard method of fertility preservation. Although there can be some scatter effect with the radiation and it's important to consider whether or not a patient is receiving concomitant chemotherapy, which could certainly also have gonadotoxic effects. So in 2012, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine lifted the experimental label of, on um, oocyte crowd preservation um, because of the advent of vitrification and um, improved pregnancy rates. However, we still have limited data about oocyte crowd preservation and 
um, adolescents. Um, this study was actually just published earlier this year and um, it included adolescent and young adult patients aged 13 to 21 who were undergoing um, oocyte cryopreservation um, prior to a cancer diagnosis, uh, excuse me, cancer treatment. Um, 38 patients underwent oocyte stimulation. Um, and you can see here um, a table comparing the adolescent 13 to 17 year old age group and the young adults 18 to 21 year old age group. Um, the mean number of days stimulated was the same for both, 10 days. Um, they had a similar number of oocytes retrieved and a similar number of oocytes cryopreserved. And there was also no statistical difference in some of the baseline characteristics, including the BMI, anti-malarian hormone levels, peak estradiol, and FSH dose. Although there was a trend in younger adolescents requiring a slightly higher FSH dose. Um, at the time of the publication of this data, um, they had not had any survivors return yet to use their oocytes. So unfortunately, we don't have any um, data on pregnancy rates. But I think this is important to establish that um, oocyte cryopreservation is feasible in adolescents. Um, so what are some of the special considerations um, for oocyte cryopreservation? Well, one, it's not available for prepubertal patients. Um, as I mentioned earlier, young adolescents may require higher gonadotropin doses, uh, potentially due to an immature HPO axis. And some adolescents may require transabdominal approach for oocyte retrieval. Um, and this can sometimes be a little bit more technically challenging. And certainly timing, you know, the urgency of initiation of cancer therapy sometimes doesn't allow for oocyte stimulation cycles, for example, in our leukemia patients. Um, and there's certainly a variability in insurance coverage as well, so cost can be an issue. Knowing that, um, what are the investigal, uh, excuse me, investigational fertility preservation methods that we have available? Um, so immature oocyte cryopreservation is um, a method that's used, not very commonly, but it is um, done. Um, it doesn't require stimulation. Um, but it does require, again, procedural sedation um, and anesthesia. And um, in this case, um, it requires in vitro oocyte maturation. And again, no ovarian hormonal function is preserved. Um, ovarian tissue freezing or ovarian tissue cryopreservation is another um, method that um, we, and this we do uh, provide here. Um, just in the last year, ASRM um, removed the experimental label um, for ovarian tissue cryopreservation, although this was based on um, data mainly for um, women who had had their ovarian tissue cryopreserved in adulthood. So that's important to note. Um, this obviously involves a surgery. Um, and in addition to preserving um, fertility, it can help preserve um, gonadal hormonal function as well. Um, but it is important to note that um, transplantation of ovarian tissue um, may not be advisable um, in certain patient populations. Um, testicular tissue freezing is a um, investigational fertility preservation method that we have available for both prepubertal and pre, excuse me, prepubertal and pubertal males. And um, a lot of the considerations are similar to um, ovarian tissue cryopreservation. I have um, GnRH agonist ovarian suppression classified slightly differently here. While it is um, sometimes advocated and used as an ovarian suppression and fertility preservation method, it is important to note that the data on um, the effectiveness really has been conflicting. Um, and we don't really have great data that suggests that GnRH agonist use um, really provides reliable and effective um, fertility preservation. So I think this is important to note when counseling patients. While we may place some patients on GnRH agonists for, for example, for menstrual suppression, um, it should not be um, presented as equivalent efficacy um, for fertility preservation as the other methods that we have available. And so I'm going to switch, uh, the presentation now is going to switch over to Dr. Orwig.
Let me see if I can mute myself. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so this slide will serve as a, a crossover, both as a summary of what Serena has told you about and also um, an introduction of the next section, which will focus uh, largely on options um, for young patients who aren't able to take advantage of um, standard of care fertility preservation options. Um, so as, as Serena said, uh, medical treatments for cancer uh, or other conditions can cause permanent infertility. And I always like to uh, emphasize the and other conditions um, because it's not just cancer patients that come to us to seek fertility preservation options. Uh, it also includes conditions like bone marrow transplantation for uh, benign diseases like sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia. Uh, we are also starting to see a lot of transgender patients that are on either hormone suppression or um, cross-sex steroids that in, can impact their fertility. And so really we're interested in any patient um, who is at risk of infertility because of their disease or their medical treatment or other circumstances. Uh, for that reason, uh, the advice from our learned societies is that all, all patients should be educated about the impacts of their treatment on their future fertility and presented with options for preserving fertility. And Serena has already told you about the standard of care options that include uh, egg, sperm, and embryo freezing. <clears throat> but for this audience, I think it's important to note uh, that those options obviously are not available to prepubertal boys and girls simply because they're not yet producing mature eggs uh, or mature sperm. And there are many circumstances in adolescents and adults uh, where for a variety of reasons, it's also uh, not possible to produce eggs or sperm. And so we need other options. And for children, we think this is a, an important uh, human health care problem because the good news is that the five-year survival rate for kids with cancer is now over 85%. So what that means is that we're producing a lot of survivors that still have their entire reproductive life in front of them. Uh, they're probably not thinking about the family that they might want to have uh, in the future, but maybe that's something that we as a, as a medical and research community can help them to think about uh, as they work through the diagnosis and treatment of their primary disease. Well, uh, for that reason, there are centers uh, worldwide, including our fertility preservation program here, that are actively cryopreserving ovarian tissues for girls and testicular tissue for boys, because we anticipate that in the future, we'll be able to mature those tissues uh, to produce eggs uh, or sperm using either uh, transplantation methods in vivo or uh, doing it ex vivo or outside of the body. And there are uh, promising options for doing that in the research pipeline. We won't talk about that extensively today, but we'll touch on them. Uh, but because we knew that the, there were these options coming down the pipeline several years ago, uh, we established the Fertility Preservation Program in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a multidisciplinary um, effort where we started to ask the question, should we be cryopreserving testicular and ovarian tissues for patients now? Because we believe that we'll have options for them in the future to thaw those tissues and produce eggs or sperm. And at that time, uh, we decided that that was a reasonable thing to do um, for those patients that we considered at significant risk um, of infertility. And uh, for us uh, in our program, both for boys and girls, uh, just two broad categories that Serena uh, briefly introduced earlier is that significant risks regarding oculating therapies, both for boys or girls, um, at our institution uh, is uh, any patient who's receiving a cyclophosphamide equivalent dose of greater than um, four grams per meter squared. And we just recently uh, updated our uh, uh, eligibility to um, anybody who's getting a bone marrow transplantation would qualify. Uh, even though, uh, even with reduced intensity regimens, which use lower doses um, of alkylating chemotherapy, we understand that many of those patients are getting additional treatments. Take uh, the case of sickle cell, for example. Uh, those patients oftentimes are getting repetitive blood transfusions and hydroxyurea, which are also both toxic to fertility, uh, and that effect is additive to the alkylating chemotherapy. Well, like I said, we decided in, um, in 2010 that it was reasonable to start preserving tissues for boys and girls, and since that time, 
uh, we've frozen tissues for 352 boys uh, and in 91 girls or women. Maybe just a small point, um, for the testicular tissues, the patients are almost exclusively prepubertal boys, um, but we do have instances where we've frozen tissues for uh, teenage or adult uh, men. Uh, ovarian tissues, on the other hand, it's about equally divided between prepubertal girls and adolescent or adult um, women. Circumstances there are different. You'll also note that there's a numbers difference between boys and girls, and that's uh, not because we like boys more than girls. Um, it's in part because the surgical procedure to retrieve testicular tissue is less invasive than the procedure to retrieve ovarian tissue, which of course is an abdominal surgery. But also, as you'll see on the next slide, uh, we have for several years now been offering uh, testicular tissue freezing, not only at our site in Pittsburgh, which is indicated by the uh, yellow star, but also all of the blue star sites around the United States and even some uh, sites uh, in the Middle East. We developed this coordinated network of uh, ne coordinated network of centers mechanism because we were frequently approached by families who wanted to um, access the experimental testicular tissue freezing option. Um, but when they learned that they had to travel to Pittsburgh to access that experimental option, uh, it became inaccessible to them either because they had a sick child or because the cost burden of having to travel um, to Pittsburgh. And so now we've changed our model where all of those sites with blue stars um, are able to do the surgical procedure on site and using this model, uh, the tissue travels rather than the patient. So they ship the tissues to Pittsburgh. We do the processing and freezing um, for them, and then those tissues are actually frozen and stored, they're stored off-site um, at a company called Reprotech. Then just in this past year, we started a new mechanism. It's similar to coordinated centers, and that's indicated by the green stars. Uh, those sites are actually contracted services sites rather than research, and in those cases, we provide um, both testicular tissue freezing and ovarian tissue freezing, and so uh, you'll see on this map that the testicular tissues are all the, all the red balloons. Um, uh, ovarian tissues are the green balloons, and all of those green balloons that you see on those green stars really have popped up just in the, in the last year as we've signed on those contracted services sites. So when we receive tissues, either locally or from uh, distant sites, uh, the process is always the same and relatively simple. Um, tissues are processed in a, um, in a BSL-2 biosafety uh, cabinet under sterile conditions. Uh, for testicular tissues, the tissue is simply cut up into small pieces measuring uh, two to five millimeters across. For ovarian tissues, the process is a little bit different. Um, we peel the outer cortex off of the ovary because that's where the immature follicles uh, reside. And then that cortex is cut into strips that measure 0 0.5 to 2 centimeters, uh, 0 0.5 by 2 centimeters uh, in size. And in either case, freezing occurs uh, using a method called controlled slow rate freezing. You can see um, uh, this machine here on the bottom uh, that causes the cooling temperature to decrease at a control controlled slow rate until finally the tissues are dropped um, in liquid nitrogen. Maybe before I leave this slide, I'll just say one thing about the surgical procedure, and that is um, for testicular tissues, uh, we have the option either to collect tissues by biopsy or to take uh, one whole testis, assuming the other one is still functional. Um, as you can imagine, the majority of patients uh, have opted for a biopsy, and these uh, biopsy procedures typically involve removal of about 20% uh, um, of one testis in the biopsy. Um, for ovarian tissues, uh, we in almost all sites around the world remove one uh, whole ovary. Uh, I don't think, Serena, have we ever biopsied an ovary here? Not that I know of. Yeah, so it's a it's whole ovary, and that's pretty standard. There are a couple of sites in the world that will collect ovarian tissue by biopsy. Next slide. So uh, this slide is just to give you an idea um, of the kinds of diseases that we see in kids defined as under 18. I'm not gonna go through all of the diseases, but you all can look for your favorite diseases on here, except to point out that the major categories that we see in kids um, are sarcomas, uh, CNS tumors, 
uh, leukemias, and we see quite a bit of bone marrow transplantation for benign diseases. And an emerging population, both in kids and adults, is the transgender population, which you can see here represents 2.8% of our um, patients, even though we've really only been seeing those patients in the last uh, year or so. Next slide. The diagnoses for um, adults, many are similar, but you begin to see a higher prevalence of some other diagnoses, including testicular cancers, uh, breast cancers. Um, uh, and also we see a lot of women who are doing elective egg freezing because um, they're busy developing, a lot of reasons for it, but they can uh, include that they're uh, busy developing their academic or professional careers and aren't ready to start family until a little bit later in life. Uh, but are concerned about the biological clock and that uh, as um, uh, as the, their age creeps towards greater than 35 and approaching 40, it becomes more and more difficult to get pregnant. And so many women are opting to cryopreserve eggs while they're still young uh, <clears throat> and preserve uh, their fertile potential for when they're ready to start their families. Next slide. Okay. So this gives you a summary of the options uh, that um, are available. Uh, first and foremost, it, it's an important to um, emphasize that sperm or semen cryopreservation is the standard um, and established mechanism for fertility preservation in males. Um, and it doesn't even have to be an outstanding semen sample because we have a variety of assisted reproductive technologies uh, that are available uh, in the IVF clinic. Uh, ranging from IUI, which requires a lot of modal sperm, uh, IVF, which requires a moderate amount of modal sperm, about 10,000 per egg, or ICSI, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where only one sperm is required. Uh, we manually poke it into the egg. And in this case, the sperm doesn't even have to be able to swim since we're manually poking it into an egg. So if at all possible, uh, saving a semen sample is the frontline uh, option for fertility preservation. Um, and uh, even if the semen sample is poor, uh, there's still fertile potential. For kids and other patients who aren't able to save a semen sample, I told you that we have the option for testicular tissue freezing. And the middle panels here uh, summarize a variety of techniques that we believe might be used um, to mature those tissues to produce sperm, either by transplantation back into the body uh, or by maturation of the tissue outside of the body. Um, Serena has done two clicks here to highlight uh, two methods that we believe are mature and ready for the clinic. Um, one is a cell-based method on top. Uh, this is where the tissue is digested with enzymes to produce a suspension of cells. Uh, included in that suspension will be spermatogonial stem cells that are responsible for continuous sperm production throughout the adult life of a man. And we imagine that we can take those cells and transplant them back into the seminiferous tubules of the testis where they will establish spermatogenesis and in some cases even restore normal fertility. So it might be possible to have a child uh, in the normal way. The other method that is mature and we believe ready for the clinic is, um, is transplanting intact pieces of testicular tissue. Here the objective is not to restore fertility, but rather to let that tissue mature inside the body to produce sperm and then the tissue would be retrieved to isolate sperm and fertilize by intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And I highlight these two techniques um, because as I said, these are both mature techniques that we believe are ready for the clinic now. And in fact, we're approved to do both of these techniques at the clinic um, here in Pittsburgh. And before I leave this slide, one final thing, a view toward the future. Um, if you had a scenario uh, where a person couldn't preserve either sperm or a testicular sample, uh, it may one, be, one day be possible to take any somatic cell from the body, including a skin biopsy, reprogram those cells into induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, which then can be differentiated into primordial germ cell-like cells that can either be transplanted back into the testis or differentiated into sperm uh, in a Petri dish. Uh, if this technology ever comes to fruition in the human clinic, then it won't be necessary to talk about fertility preservation before treatment because you could get a skin cell uh, whenever that individual is ready to start a family and convert it um, to sperm. Sounds like science fiction, but that's something that's already been done with the production of healthy babies and mice and people around the world are working very hard to translate this to monkeys and humans.
So uh, from my last uh, couple of slides here, I just want to tell you, show you a teeny bit of data related to the autologous testicular tissue grafting. That's the lower red box, um, because we've actually demonstrated that that works in non-human primates. That's on the next slide. Let's see what the next slide is. Oh, okay. Um, so what we've done here is grafted tissue either under the back skin or under the scrotal skin. This is immature tissue that was collected uh, when the uh, monkey was prepubertal. Uh, we grafted that tissue under the skin and then between eight and 12 months later, we recovered the tissue and teased it apart uh, to isolate sperm. We were successful to find sperm. Uh, so we sent those sperm to our friends in Oregon uh, who have a monkey IVF laboratory they performed intracytoplasmic sperm injection to fertilize eggs and then transferred embryos um, that resulted in the birth of Grady, which stands for graft drive baby. Uh, she was born on April 16th, um, 2018, and she's the world's first baby that was born from autologously grafted, frozen and thawed, prepubertal testicular tissue. So we imagine that this represents uh, our model of a prepubertal cancer survivor. And the next slide just shows you the uh, Grady skin. So I didn't anticipate that the sound would be that loud, but Grady's still in Oregon. And the great thing about that is that it allows us to monitor her development uh, side by side. Uh, with other monkeys that were born the normal way. And by all indications, Grady is developing normally, even though she was born in an unusual way. So I'll pass the podium back to Serena and she can take the female experimental side from here. Can you guys see the next slide right now? Yep. With the fertility preservation, restoration, women and girls? Yep. Okay, excellent, just wanna make sure. All right, so as Kyle had mentioned um, earlier, um, he, he brought you through the uh, standard of care and experimental methods available for prepubertal males as well as um, pubertal and adult males as well. For um, pubertal um, females and adult women, as we talked about earlier, um, the most common standard of care fertility preservation um, procedures, mature oocyte um, stimulation and cryopreservation, preservation. And um, as I mentioned, this was established as a, a standard of care method back in 2012. Um, the second box that's highlighted here is the ovarian tissue cryopreservation preservation um, procedure with subsequent um, ovarian tissue transplantation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit, but as you can see here, it depicts the ovarian tissues. In our case, we typically take an entire ovary, um, the tissues processed, cryopreserved, and then when a patient is ready to attempt conception, typically, the tissue is thawed and then grafted. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at the next slide. Okay. So the, live, uh, the first live birth from ovarian tissue transplantation was actually reported in 2004, um, and that's the study shown here on the slide. Um, this um, was done in basically in a 25-year-old female back in uh, 1997. Um, she underwent ovarian tissue cryopreservation prior to treatment for stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma. And then in 2003, um, you know, she had developed ovarian insufficiency she decided to have her ovarian tissue reimplanted. Um, and the tissue was reimplanted in an orthotopic position in the um, right pelvic sidewall ovarian fossa. Um, and this patient actually went on to conceive spontaneously, and this resulted in a singleton life birth. The next reported case of um, pregnancy and birth after transplantation of cryopreserved ovarian tissue um, was reported in 2005. And this was um, a woman who had um, actually undergone um, treatment for Hodg non-Hodgkin's lymphoma um, and prior to treatment had ovarian tissue cryopreservation performed um, 
two years after developing ovarian insufficiency um, at 28 years old, she had her ovarian tissue um, reimplanted. Um, in this case, the ovarian tissue was grafted um, into the atrophic remaining ovary. Um, the patient developed spontaneous menses eight months later and then subsequently underwent um, in vitro fertilization and this resulted in a singleton live birth. Um, and this study here actually depicts the first um, case of a peripubertal or premenarchal um, a live birth that resulted from um, ovarian tissue that was crowd preserved in the peripubertal or premenarchal period. Um, this was done for a um, 13 year old patient with sickle cell anemia prior to receiving um, a stem cell transplantation. The patient had already um, had evidence of pubertal development with breast development, but had not yet undergone menarche at the time of ovarian tissue crowd preservation. And subsequently, 14 years later, she had her, her ovarian tissue um, grafted back. Um, and in this case, this was again, um, um, well, initially the patient un underwent assisted reproductive therapies, um, but didn't move forward um, because of uh, that relationship ended. But subsequently with a new partner, she was actually able to conceive um, spontaneously. And again, this resulted in a singleton live birth. And then more, um, more recently in 2008, um, a case report was published of the first successful pregnancy in a woman with beta thalassemia following transplantation of ovarian tissue, crowd preserved before puberty. And this woman um, had ovarian tissue crowd preserved at age nine um, when she was still prepubertal. Um, and subsequently um, she had the tissue reimplanted. Um, and this woman underwent IVF and um, had a singleton um, pregnancy that was healthy. So as you can see, um, we now have, um, uh, we've gone beyond case reports um, at this point of live births worldwide. Um, this, this review article was published in 2017. And at that time, over 130 children had been born worldwide from um, transplanted um, ovarian, cryopreserved preserved ovarian tissue. Um, and um, there have been over 360 transplantations um, of ovarian tissue at this time. And the age range of when the ovarian tissue was cryopreserved preserved ranges from prepubertal. So um, that would be the nine-year-old that I mentioned on the previous slide um, to the mid thirties. Um, and uh, 29 to, they saw a 29 to 32% delivery rate with half of the singletons conceived naturally. Um, and like I mentioned um, last year, ASRM removed the experimental label from ovarian tissue cryopreservation because of the great success um, in the data um, showing successful live births from um, ovarian uh, cryopreserved ovarian tissue being transplanted back. Um, however, it's important to note that many institutions, including our own, still perform ovarian tissue cryopreservation under an experimental research protocol. Um, and this is for a few reasons. One, um, this allows for better um, oversight. Um, it also allows for us to collect some tissue for research purposes, as this is still an area that definitely we need additional research um, and um, for data collection as well. And as I mentioned before too, Importantly, with ovarian tissue crowd preservation, with the transplanted tissue, you also have um, presum uh, resumption of hormone function. Um, and at this point, um, the duration of hormone function has actually lasted beyond what we expected. Um, it's been reported to be up to 10 years um, from the data that we have at this point. So um, this slide here, this top row just briefly reviews the process for ovarian tissue cryopreservation again. The image on the very left shows um, an oophorectomy being performed for the ovarian tissue cryopreservation, then um, removal of the cortex where the immature oocytes are located, um, processing of the tissue and, and cryopreservation. The second row shows images of several different techniques used for ovarian tissue transplantation, or rather I should say for orthotopic ovarian tissue transplantation. The first image on the left shows um, a method where a peritoneal window is created in 
the pelvic sidewall ovarian fossa and the ovarian tissue strips are placed there. The second method, um, the remaining atrophic ovary has a portion of the cortex removed and then patches of the thawed um, ovarian tissue patched in. And then the third technique shown here on the right, um, incisions are made in the tunica albigenia of the ovary and tunnels are created and the thawed ovarian tissue is then placed in um, these tunnels and um, sutured into place. However, um, in cases, for example, of severe pelvic adhesions, um, orthotopic ovarian tissue transplantation might not be possible. And so there has been um, much um, uh, research also um, looked into regarding heterotopic ovarian tissue transplantation. Um, of note, there have been no successful pregnancies um, from ovarian tissue transplanted in subcutaneous locations. Um, however, um, in cases where the ovarian tissue was transplanted in the uh, anterior abdominal wall um, below the peritoneum, um, we do have cases um, of pregnancy. And in these cases, um, oocyte stimulation and in vitro fertilization was performed. Um, so certainly, um, in general, the preference is for orthotopic ovarian tissue transplantation um, for several reasons. One, um, this also allows for the opportunity for spontaneous conception if a patient still has their fallopian tubes. Um, and it also provides a more anatomic location for oocyte retrieval um, in the standard um, methods. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, um, Ovarian tissue transplantation not, may not be suitable for all um, patients. For example, in our leukemia patients or ovarian cancer patients where we have a concern for potential reseeding of malignant cells with ovarian um, tissue transplanted back in. And so this is a situation where um, in vitro oocyte maturation may come into play. Um, it's not widely done at this point, um, but this study here um, this, or rather, this case report here was published in 2014, and this was for a 21-year-old 20 21 woman who underwent um, interval bilateral oophorectomy for ovarian carcinomas. Um, when her second ovary was taken, the tissue was brought to the IVF lab, and all visible follicles were aspirated, um, and four immature oocytes were obtained, and then um, they underwent in vitro maturation and then subsequent ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Um, and then three embryos were cryopreserved and this patient subsequently underwent, um, after her treatment underwent a transfer of two embryos and had delivery of a healthy infant. Um, at this time, um, one of the things that um, is being done with um, the, the research tissue of um, prepubertal ovarian tissue um, is the technique of in vitro oocyte maturation for um, oocytes from um, prepubertal ovarian tissue. So this is definitely an area that would be very important, for example, for our leukemia patients. And I'll hand this back over to, to Kyle now. Uh, thanks, Serena. So we thought we'd um, uh, uh, finish up by covering what we uh, see through our experiences of some of the barriers in access to fertility preservation care, and maybe this can serve as a stimulation for discussion uh, at the end of the meeting or in subsequent meetings. Um, so of course, one of the, the major barriers is timely counseling of patients. And we understand that frequently there can be a compressed time frame between the time of diagnosis and when treatment needs to begin and that patients and their families are being overwhelmed with a lot of different information, uh, not only including diagnosis of the primary disease, uh, but also uh, the treatment plan. We know they need to have a lot of appointments uh, to get the ball rolling. And so it's a relatively sensitive thing to introduce a new topic about fertility that really is about planning for life after cure. Uh, and we need to do it efficiently uh, and effectively. Um, we're very fortunate to have patient navigators and clinical coordinators uh, in some places that uh, are very helpful um, to uh, make this happen at the time of diagnosis. And actually, one of our greatest partners is the Hemont Group um, at Children's, led by Erica Freeling. Uh, 
Uh, so they've been great partners, but as you know, UPMC is a giant health system uh, and we have a lot of work to do to um, identify similar partners and navigators throughout the system. Uh, another uh, issue, uh, maybe stemming in part from the fact uh, that there's this term called oncofertility, uh, which is kind of a different way to say fertility preservation, but it gives the idea that this is for cancer patients only. So I always try to emphasize that fertility preservation is for any patient who's at risk of infertility due to their disease uh, or to their treatment. And I gave you a couple of additional examples, including bone marrow transplantation and transgender. There's also differences in sexual development, autoimmune diseases. Um, and, and others, and, and actually it's the patients who teach us um, uh, where the market is for fertility preservation because uh, every new patient that walks in the door is a new opportunity to learn and to develop options. <coughs> the other issue uh, may not be obvious, but in the children's uh, um, hospital setting, there are very few children's hospitals that have the infrastructure or the expertise to provide fertility care because that's not typically something that you deal with um, in children. We're fortunate in the UPMC system that we have multiple disciplines under one umbrella uh, and, and including disciplines that impact both children uh, and adult uh, issues. And so I think it's as easy here as it is anywhere. Um, but this is part of the reason why we have an extensive coordinated network of centers around the country, because in some cases it's very difficult um, for children's hospitals to find partners uh, locally that can help with the fertility piece. And then the final barrier, and we'll cover this in the next slide, uh, obviously is uh, the cost. So I'll give you a little bit of insight about what the costs are um, and or how they're covered. That's on the next slide. So for the standard of care, egg freezing, embryo freezing, sperm freezing, um, these are uh, typically either patient pay or insurance pay. Important to know um, that it's usually patient pay because most fertility procedures aren't covered by insurance. Although there's a movement nationwide now um, to push for the understanding that, that um, fertility related to a primary uh, disease such as cancer uh, isn't the same as treating infertility of a couple ready to have a baby. It, it really, it's a side effect of the primary disease and treatment plan, and that this really should be covered by insurance. There are actually 10 states in the country now that mandate fertility preservation coverage, um, and several states have legislation uh, in the work. Uh, and also important to know that there's financial assistance available through a variety of mechanisms and our program coordinators can uh, help your team and your patients uh, work through those and determine eligibility. Um, for the experimental options of testicular and ovarian tissue freezing, uh, right now we do both of those under a research protocol in Pittsburgh. So in that case, research pays for the surgery, the tissue processing and freezing, and also the first year of storage. Um, the patients or families would be responsible for ongoing uh, annual storage fees, which are typically in the neighborhood of about $300 um, per year. Uh, that $300 per year is similar, whether it's tissues, whether it's eggs, sperm, or embryos, uh, $300 a year is the typical annual fee. Um, for us here in Pittsburgh, the research pay model was essential even to get um, started uh, because uh, there, um, was resistance to uh, referring any patients for fertility preservation if it would incur an additional um, cost. So just to get the program started uh, in the first place, we covered the cost in research. We've been fortunate to be able to continue to do that uh, for the experimental tissue freezing options, either through philanthropy or institutional funds uh, over the last um, 10 years. In the long term, that's not sustainable as a business uh, plan. Um, and so eventually there will be charges associated with that, but hopefully that will also correspond with time when maybe we can get insurances to cover fertility preservation uh, options. And finally, uh, it's essential to document safety and feasibility of our experimental FP procedures because we think that this is what is going to be the ammunition to transition these techniques towards standard of care. Uh, Serena already told you about the great progress that's happening with ovarian tissue transplantation, and that is what has led ASRM to recommend that the experimental label can be lifted from ovarian tissue crop preservation. And once it becomes standard of care, then it would be eligible for insurance coverage if that becomes available. <clears throat> 
So finally, I'd like to tell you about our fertility preservation uh, team. It's grown quite a bit uh, over the years. Uh, one of the most important things that I want to point out is that this is really a multidisciplinary effort. Um, and uh, you can see on this slide, I'm sure there's people that you all know, uh, but we have experts in adult and pediatric urology. We have experts in adult and pediatric gynecology. We have uh, experts in heme oncology um, and other cancers. Uh, we have uh, experts in pediatric endocrinology, which relates to our transgender individuals. Um, and finally, uh, and by the way, this is fun, uh, being able to treat the whole patient in a multidisciplinary effort, which is something that I think that we can uniquely do here in Pittsburgh. Um, and just to represent the kind of progress and in institutional support that we have, all of the people who are surrounded by the red box here are now um, full tide paid, paid staff whose job it is to, to make fertility preservation as accessible uh, and easy as possible in the context of diagnosis and treatment for the primary disease. Uh, as I said, we've uh, had a wonderful relationship with the people in the Hemont group and others uh, at Children's Hospital. Some of those names are listed here and I'm sure that this is not inclusive, but thank you all. Uh, for your efforts. We very much um, appreciate it. And also in subsequent discussions would appreciate any advice for how uh, we can establish similar types of mechanisms uh, in other clinics around the UPMC system. So I think that brings us to, uh, to the end. Uh, probably the most important thing that we can communicate to you at this time is that uh, we're easy to access. Uh, we have a dedicated phone line and a dedicated email address uh, that uh, providers or patients can call to get additional information and uh, to get set up and scheduled for either standard or experimental options for fertility preservation. Thank you so much for that excellent um, presentation. We have a few questions. Dr. Ritchie asks, do we know the fertility potential of women who have one ovary as opposed to two? Do you want me to take that, Serena, or do you want to do it? Sure, Kyle, go ahead. <laughs> so um, no, the fert fertile potential isn't decreased at all, uh, or at least not very much. And I think to understand that, what you need to understand is that women are born with about a million eggs in their ovaries. Um, as you know, they ovulate once a month after puberty. And if you do the math, that only adds up to 500. So most of egg loss is not happening um, during the regular menstrual cycles. What happens is that both ovaries are continually um, maturing follicles throughout your life. Most of them mature up at the wrong time during the cycle, and so they just die. So it's a loss. It's not a very efficient system, to be honest. So, uh, and that's happening on both ovaries. Um, so if you take one ovary out, the other ovary is going to continue to do that, developing up follicles that die, developing up follicles that die. Eventually a follicle uh, develops up at the right point in the menstrual cycle and gets ovulated, um, but that rate doesn't change whether you have one ovary or two, that, that process continues uh, throughout um, post-pubertal life until menopause happens. Dr. Williams says, thank you both for a fascinating talk. That's amazing. I'm curious about how the subject gets broached initially with the family and by whom. You so, want to take that, Serena? Sure. I, I think that can vary a bit. I think um, certainly we have a wonderful um, pediatric hemonc group here. And so, um, you know, there, there have actually been some studies that perhaps the fertility preservation counseling should come from someone other than their um, primary um, oncologist who is discussing the actual um, disease just because um, that kind of separates out fertility preservation um, as a separate topic. Um, here, oftentimes if the patient is impatient and they have just been diagnosed or they're being seen for other reasons, um, a member of our fertility inpatient fertility preservation group will actually perform a consultation um, and certainly in terms of our um, BMT population, the BMT nurse coordinators are actually fantastic in, in terms of identifying patients who um, may be coming up on BMT and then alerting us to um, um, the need for uh, discussing 
um, fertility preservation options with the, the patient and family. This The world today is different than it was 15 years ago when this was a fledgling field. So another thing that happens a lot is that patients and families are very well educated and so they'll reach out themselves. Yeah. But I think that the most important thing is that you all are the primary contacts uh, with the patients. And so that's, and this is, this is a time sensitive issue. So that's the best option to introduce the, the topic. Uh, and important to know this shouldn't be a burden in the diagnosis and treatment plan. We wanna make it as easy as possible to hand off so we have some of the primary care team that are very comfortable to do the um, counseling. Others would much rather uh, pass off to our phone number or phone line and have our program coordinators do it and either mechanism is, is fine, of course. And, and that's where the utility of a patient navigator comes into play where they can really help identify um, these patients um, who, um, May require counseling or be eligible for 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 counseling and and fertility preservation options thank you so much for that excellent answer and an excellent presentation we're going to end the main portion but um, we will invite everyone to join in the meet and greet through the separate link <laughs>